Shall we all rise for our theme song? scripture reading tonight, I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Luke chapter 1 verse 37. Luke chapter 1 verse 37. I will be reading from the New International Version. For nothing is impossible with God. Let us kneel for a word of prayer. O mighty Father, O Prince of Peace, Kings of Kings and Lords of Lords, we thank you for the, for the wonderful experience we have been having in this PYC. If no one can testify in this crowd, I can personally testify that I have been blessed. And dear God, may you continue to bless us. And most of all, dear Lord, we're coming in your presence, not as though we deserve anything, but it's because that blood that was shed on Calvary will never lose its power. And dear Lord, we're deemed righteous in your sight, though we're not. So dear Lord, at this hour, we would like to invite your presence here with us tonight. We know that though you have come down personally with us, there is also the angels of the devil surrounding us. But I would like to ask you, dear Lord, to encamp around all your righteous people so that we can hear your word. We can take you in our personal life so that one day when you come, we'll say this is the Lord whom we serve. So dear Lord, continue to bless us. Keep open our ears and keep our eyes open so that we can listen to your holy word sent by the messenger of the Lord, Pastor David Ashrick. 
Bless him and help him to speak your word and your word alone, I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God is good and all the time. Amen. I have some glad tidings to share with you from the upper room experience, the prayer room. Uh, this morning at 7 a.m., there was, it was truly a blessing. I skipped my breakfast because there wasn't enough time for me to make it there on time. And wow, just, it was really an upper room experience. And brothers and sisters, I just encourage you all to go. And I read this quote in The Desire of Ages, and it reminded me of why the upper room experience is special. In Desire of Ages, it says that our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. And when you're in this environment where you're praying and you're prompted by the Holy Spirit, and it's just a feeling of, of heaven, because when you're praying, God doesn't come down to us, but we are actually in the presence of God. And continuing on, it says, These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of his grace, when supported by a Christ-like life, has an irresistible power that works for the saving of souls. God desires that our praise shall ascend to him, marked by our own individuality. And so... When I was here last time, I knew a lot of Filipinos asked me, do I have Friendster, you know? And right now, Friendster is out of date. Facebook is what is very popular now. Everywhere I go, before I go to Philippines or Brunei or Singapore, I'm on Facebook. I'm like, hey, brother, I'm coming, da-da-da. And, you know, it's an excellent um, social network. And why is it so popular? It's because people can put pictures, people can put comments. And that's the same thing with uh, the prayer room. And so I encourage you to come, and we have our brother here, Adave, and he just has a wonderful experience to share with you. Good evening, everyone. God is good all the time. God is good. Do you feel that you are empowered? Praise God for that. If you are empowered, then praise God. That's the power of prayer in your life. Thank you very much, Brother Davis. I thank the good Lord for bringing me here. I'd like to share with you two things that I have experienced through the United Prayer. You know, sometimes we can be very, um, when we look at prayer, we say sometimes that's a ridiculous thing to do, that's a weird thing to do, just kneeling down and praying for that long hours. And you know, sometimes we may be thinking, uh, that is particular person says amen quickly. Uh, we might have that experience. You know, I used to have different perspectives about prayer. But when I got into the prayer power, my perspective has changed. The, the way I view, the way I think about prayer has changed. And there are two things that I learned. One is that, you know, when you want to talk to someone important, maybe the so-called leaders of the world, you have to go through certain procedures or protocols. You have to see advisors to see people to make appointment for you to see the, the, the particular leader they want to see. But you know, my friends, when you want to see God and when you want to talk to him, you don't need to make an appointment with another person. All you have to do is come just as you are and talk to him because he's more than willing to listen to you and accept you as his son and daughter. You know, I begin to develop this. Uh, I praise God for developing in me this desire that I look forward. You know, I, I have an appointment with God and I say, God, I want to pray with, I want to meet you on this time. And as I look forward, forward to the time, I'm more like I'm restless. I'm going to say, God, let this time go quickly so I can have the time to come and talk to you. Because I feel that it was a privilege for me to talk to God of the universe. Another thing that I also learned was that, you know, Praying there in the United Prayer or anywhere we can pray, it is important to pray for our brothers and sisters for the salvation. You know, one thing that I learned that 
just as important as a mighty preacher stands here and preach, just as a mighty um, evangelizing campaign that you can do, that is uh, just, the same, uh, just the same way prayer does not make a great difference. How important it is when you are praying for the brother and sister over there, you are getting down on your knees, you are pleading to God and say, God, please save this all. And the Holy Spirit is working on that particular brother and sister until he or she surrenders his life to Jesus Christ. That is the most exciting experience that we can experience in life. And I see that as important as any other method of evangelism we can pray. So prayer also plays plays an important role in the salvation of human life. I'd like to finish this with a facts from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. I'd like to read that. We read Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18. Praying always with prayer and supplications and spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance, supplication for all saints. Brothers and sisters, we can also be part of this God's salvation plan by praying for our brothers and sisters to be saved in the kingdom of God. May God bless us with this. Good evening, everyone. How are you tonight? As if they're not, as if the evening is not good, JD. Yeah, maybe, fine, uh, maybe they're tired. Good evening, everyone. You know what? Let's try something so that I have an idea of how you feel. Every time I ask that, how are you tonight? Can you please say something? I am empowered. Can we try that? How are you tonight? I am empowered. Amen. Amen. So thank you. Did you enjoy the workshops tonight? Or this afternoon? How's the, the, the love story of uh, the Tucson? Is it, right? Is it nice? Yeah, man, it's empowering, right? Learning that love has a deeper meaning. Yo, All right. Brother Ivan, speaking of empowering, we have someone here with us this evening. All he right. was empowered. So this guy came somewhere, and he has a name. Let's go mm -hmm. ahead and ask him. Actually, this guy is a brother of the one who just stood a while ago. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's Brother, brother Davis. Davis. Okay? This is a, a younger brother of Brother Davis. So, but Brother Kenneth, can you introduce to us, you know, who you are and where you came from? Mm, my name is uh, Kenneth Lim. I come from Vancouver, Canada. Right now, I feel like King Saul when he was anointed king. He just wants to go hide. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, we've been corporating and... God has been very good. Wow, cooperating. So, how exactly to, did you? How, how did you come to this point where you ended up cooperating? What made you, you know, end up taking this radical change? What, what, what brought you here? Hmm. This is basically my testimony, but I would say that obedience is from the heart, and truly, like I could not obey with my own free will. God mm. has really given me. Um, about five months ago, I was really lost in the world. I was just baptized about four months ago. Four months um, ago. Hmm. Five months ago, my heart was really, really empty, and I was looking for worldly things to fill it. Uh -huh. Alcohol, clubbing, dancing, and uh, all these things would, you know, they'd fill your heart for a temporary amount of time, like so one night. what happened? What happened to you? What something made you, you know, realize that one? As you get caught up in this cycle, you try to fill it, but it's always still a hole in your heart, mm. and you're looking for something to fill it. I was caught up. Uh, what fixed me, I guess, would be the love of God and Amen. truly uh, my family that didn't give up on me, that prayer truly works. Wow, prayer is so powerful. So it was basically your family that kept on praying for you that mm. got you to this point. Yes. Oh, okay. You know what, Brother JV? I, I talked to this young man. He's, we have the same story, actually, on how God work in our lives and how fa our family really prayed for us and you know something just happened and everyone were just struck and you know something has changed and and the changes is you know it's a process of changes so can you tell us what did you do in the culture work you know where are you going you know, with your brother what are you doing both of you to this culture work uh, this culture work is based on you know God says if you love me 
well, Peter, do you love me? And it's like, yes, feed my sheep. So we, this is a basis of what we wanted to go on. Mm. Uh, what brought us to core portraying, there's truly the harvest is plentiful and mm. the laborers are truly, truly few. Do you have any experience in the corporate work that you have you know, in some countries that you visit? I heard that they're corporate-turing uh, in Asia, JD, you know? They're visiting countries for the corporate work and they just drop by here in the Philippines to get some books and then I believe on the 26th or 27th they will be leaving, going back to the Malaysia yes. to do corporate work. Yes. So could you tell us a short story of uh, uh, your experience in the corporate work? Uh, Basically, my brother and I, we corporate her together. And as we go from city to city, like uh, KL, Singapore, uh, we go to Brunei, many, many cities, uh, there's one specific experience that really sticks out a lot. And uh, if, you, uh, if you look in Luke chapter 12, verse 24, it says, Consider the ravens, neither they sow nor reap, nor have storehouse nor barn, yet the Lord still feedeth them. And how much better are ye than fowls? Basically, we're on a plane from Kuching to Singapore. Uh, and on this plane, my brother and I are a little bit worried because we don't really know where we're going to stay. We don't know where we're going to eat or mm -hmm. live or put our luggage. And, uh, well, praise God, as we sat down, just, uh, as we sat down, we usually like to speak to the people around us. And, uh, my brother is speaking to a Muslim lady. And as he was promoting the great controversy and spirit of prophecy, uh, there was a Filipino pastor that my brother had met about a year ago. And he was like, he woke up and he's like, suddenly, hey, no, I remember you. And then, uh, Long story short, we had a place to eat, Amen. eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, a place to sleep. Uh, we had lessons with Mark Finley. Well, mm -hmm. God is truly good. He knows what we need and Amen. with faith. Wow, so you just walked out in faith and there it was in front of you. Yes. All prepared for you by the hand of God. Amen. Amen. Um, Kenneth, uh, you, you told me that you have this experience of reading this uh, Spirit of Prophecy books, you know, and then it came to real you came to realization that these books are really something while doing culture work. Could you tell us how, how, how these books impacted your life? Wow, these Spirit of Prophecy books are amazing. They expound the Bible so well, and all these principles come from the Bible. And we must have an open heart uh, when we read the Bible and we read you know, messages from Ellen G. White because it's very easy to hold on to your sins. It's very easy to say, no, no, she's wrong. Uh, I, I don't need this and that. But we must mm. come with a humble heart. And uh, for myself, I would say uh, music reform is very, very big on me. Mm. Uh, why? why? Why do you think? That's, how about music reform? What, ha what's happen what happened about your reading? <laughs> uh, I would say after I was baptized, previous to my baptism, I was studying, for, I was studying my Bible, studying it very, very hard, uh, as well as Ellen G. White, refraining from anything that wasn't really Christ-centered. And... Uh, as I got on the plane to go to Asia, mm -hmm. it's about a 16-hour ride. And a 16-hour ride, you like to listen to music, right? So uh, I filled up my iPod with, you know, a lot of worldly music. Uh -huh. Nothing bad, nothing to do with God, nothing to do against God. But uh, I know that a lot of people had said to me, you know, just get rid of all this music, listen to hymnals, no drums, and all this. And in my heart, I was like, oh, no, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> I will just, you know, I, I don't feel convicted about that. I, I don't think it has anything to harm God. I don't think it harms me. But the thing is that two months later, as I was in Asia, core board hearing, I was listening to my iPod, and wow, truly, it, as you build a relationship with Christ, Amen. he does Amen. talk to you. And he really convicted my heart that this music has nothing to do with me. This music is pointless. Just get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And this feeling of just, just peace came, uh, came upon me. God Amen. says, if you are heavy laden and burdened, come unto me, I'll yeah, give you rest. rest. And I believe that's the message right then and there. You can see our brother here, Kenneth, he wanted to follow God. And you can see at the beginning, he was not fully convinced. But with his, like he said, with his relationship with Jesus, as it grows, Amen. he was slowly but surely convinced. And like, you know, what we're learning from Pastor Ashrick, you can't tell where exactly you are on yes, that sir. journey. But as long as you've accepted Christ... I believe you are the child of God, amen, and I believe amen, Brother amen. Kenneth has shared it. And we would like to thank you for the time, Kenneth. If you want to know him personally, you may find him. He's always willing to share his story. That's how we found out his story. Amen. He was just willing to share how much Jesus was doing in his life. And with this, you've heard of it from his own mouth, that literature and evangelism had something to do with his life. And at this moment, we would like to call on Michael Tuazon and his wife Candice to give us more on what literature and budget has to give us. So thank you, Kenneth, and thank you, Ivan.
in Psalms 24, verse 6. The Bible says, This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Is this that generation? Are you here seeking the face of God? Amen. You know, back where Michael and I work and live, there is also a group of young people that are also seeking the Lord's face. I believe they, as well as many others from around the world, are part of this generation. And these particular students that we have a privilege to work with devote a lot of their life and time into the canvassing or coal portering work. My name is Candace Tuazon, and I am a teacher at Souls West, and it is a two-year Bible college where we are privileged to work with such students that decide to give their time, two years out of their life, to serve the Lord. And one of the great means for them to do that is through the canvassing work. It is a leadership training Bible college where the first year students will receive training for leadership through canvassing and the second year students get to do evangelism and Bible work as well. And one of my favorite experiences comes from, from a young lady that I met while I was recruiting for this particular school. I went to this to this program and shared a quote that I wasn't supposed to read. And I found out later that this, this young woman had been praying about whether or not to, to take the next step of canvassing and attend our college. And she had asked the Lord for a very specific quote, which I happened to read, but she wasn't convinced. And she said, Lord, if you really want me to go, um, make it so that I am in the same van, the same vehicle as uh, the recruiter. And of course, that happened. And then later she also shared that she had also wanted to have a friend of hers be in that same van. Originally they weren't supposed to, but at the very last minute it happened. And when she shared this with me in the field, she finally said, you know, I know that God wants me to do this. And God is very specific when it comes to asking us to devote our time and our life to doing his work. Of all of the ways that God decided to leave a blueprint of his son Jesus to us, he chose literature. The Bible that you have in your hands is literature. And we look at that as we need to get as many pieces of literature into people's homes. So at Souls West, Souls stands for the Seventh-day Adventist Outreach Leadership School. We have the privilege of teaching leadership to our young people through canvassing. And so throughout the year, we do evangelistic series, we do Bible work, but we also knock on people's doors. And the reason why we sell literature is because when you pay for something, you have value. You paid for it. You expect something. And so that's the reason why instead of just giving literature, we also sell literature. Now, Ellen White also says that the, the best training for any line of ministry is the canvassing work. And so we use that as well at our school. And so we want to challenge each of you here. Many of the people here at PYC, they're going to be doing a canvassing program this summer, and they're going to be leading it. And so for those of you who want to experience God firsthand, from door to door, pleading and praying, and I guarantee you, if you have a dead prayer life right now, I dare you to canvass. If you knock on doors, and if you canvass, I guarantee you that you're your prayer life is going to change dramatically. And so for those of you who want a richer prayer life or a richer Christian life, talk to the organizers of PYC. Ivan is one of them because they're going to be leading a summer program this year. So I want you to think and pray about that opportunity. In the United States of America, canvassing is something that the young people are really getting into. That's something that we 
are advocating, and it's something that we realize is really getting truths into the homes of people. Thank you. All right, good evening, everyone. Just two quick announcements here. First of all, how many of you have been coming to the prayer session in the morning? Okay, good. I want to invite all of you to be there tomorrow morning. I was invited to be there, and I said, sure, I'll be there. So come join me tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock right here, and we can spend some time in earnest prayer together. And I just want to echo what Candace and Michael just said, and that is that I would seriously urge you to consider spending a summer or whatever the amount of time available is that you have whole portering. And uh, I've done it. I've done Bible work for about eight years of my life and knocked on lots and lots of doors. And people say, oh, how do you preach? And how did you learn the Bible? And how did you memorize scripture? And how, how do you do? Listen, I wouldn't be able to do even half I wouldn't be one-tenth of the preacher that I am today and the communicator that I am today if I hadn't spent all of the time in Bible work, in canvassing, and in ministering to people one-on-one. -on -one. If, 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 if you think you can just stand up and preach to 100 or 200 or 1,000 or 2,000, listen, the place where you learn to do those kinds of things, to minister to a group, is to minister to one person, to speak to one person. And so I would plead with you to seriously consider doing the canvas work here in the Philippines. And let me just say one last thing about that. If you think to yourself, no, nah, I don't want to do it, that is the very reason you should do it. Does that make sense? If you're thinking, ah, it doesn't, it doesn't, I'm, I'm not the kind of person, it's, it's not the right time for me, you should seriously consider it because it will absolutely augment and enhance your personal walk with Jesus. We're going to talk tonight about two things that God cannot do, and I'm going to ask if you can just keep the slideshow presentation up there the whole time. That would be great for me. That way I can keep track of where I'm headed. Let's pray together, and then we're going to get into our message, Two Things God Cannot Do. Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to be here with these dear people. Father, you have ministered to me today, and, and as I was listening to Pastor Shives and his lovely wife and Jason give their testimony, my heart was just thrilled within me. And Father, we've been in seminars and we've been learning things today. We've heard the preached word. and Father, we have discovered that you are our friends. We are not just servants, we are sons. And we ask that as the conference continues that you please would be with us tonight. Give us a clearer picture of yourself of your son Jesus and of the gospel because father we believe as scripture says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation and we want to be empowered so please father be with us tonight we anticipate your presence with us because we're praying and asking in Jesus name let everyone say amen I have a bit of a confession to make this evening and that confession is that I used to take a very simplistic view of God and His power. I used to take a very simplistic view of God's omnipotence. We learned today in our morning session that omnipotence is one of the attributes of God. It comes from two words, omni and potent, all-powerful. I used to take a very simplistic view of God's omnipotence. I thought that because God was omnipotent, because God was all-powerful, that he could do absolutely anything. And you'll hear people say that. You'll hear people say, well, God can do anything. Nothing is impossible with God. In fact, one of our scripture readings that we looked at tonight seems to suggest that God can do whatever he wants. We're going to discover that there are, in fact, a great many things that not even God can do. Things that are impossible not just for you and not just for me, but things that are impossible for God. Now, maybe I should just pause here and, and mention this. First of all, impossible is a relative term, a relative term. Maybe we should just 
take a look here at a dictionary definition of impossible. We've got it on the screen. The dictionary says, defining the word impossible, not able to occur or be done. That which cannot exist or cannot be done, unattainable, unachievable, unobtainable. So, impossible is something not just that will not occur, but that cannot occur. Now, again, I want to remind you that impossible is a relative term. For example, there are things that are impossible for me, but are possible for other people. I cannot have a baby. That's impossible for me. I've never tried, but I would imagine that I can't do it. But it's not impossible for a woman. Half of the population can do what I cannot do. It's impossible for me, but not impossible for someone else. I cannot... Uh, let me think of another one here. It is not possible for me to preach a 15-minute sermon. I'm sure there are people who can, but I cannot. I've been running lately. I just ran my first marathon about 10 days ago, 26.2 miles. And uh, I, I run as fast as I can, and I run as hard as I can, but I cannot run a sub-three-hour marathon. The best in the world, they run marathons in just over two hours. I cannot run a sub-three-hour marathon. For me right now, that is impossible. Now, there are lots of people who can do those things, and so impossible in this sense is relative. There are things that I cannot do that others cannot do or can do. But then there's things that are impossible for anybody. For example, no human being can run a marathon in under one hour. That's not just impossible for me, that's impossible for everyone. No human being can fly from, uh, let's just say, Mindanao to Manila by flapping their arms. No human being can do that. So when we say that, that something is impossible for God, we are not just making a relative term. We are saying that this is something that not even God can do. It's not just the kind of thing that I can't do or that you can't do, that others could do. Tonight we're going to look at two things that not even God can do. Now, let's note two verses, one of which was our scripture reading, Luke chapter 18, verse 27. And he said, the thing, these things which are, are the things which are impossible with men are, what does it say there? Possible with God. Now, does that verse say that God can do anything? Does that verse say that God can do anything? No. What it says is, there are things that man cannot do, but that God can do. We have many instances of this in Scripture. These are called miracles. For example, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go into the fiery furnace, man cannot go into fiery furnace, a fiery furnace, on his own and not be consumed or burned. But can God create a situation where they can go into a furnace and not be burned? Yes or no? Okay, so that's a miracle. Impossible for man, but possible for God. Can, can man feed 5,000 men plus women and children with a few loaves and fish? Can man do that? But can God do that? Can man walk on the top, the surface of water? Is that possible for a man to do that by himself? But can God do that? The answer is yes. And so all this verse is saying is that there are things that are impossible with men, but that God can do. Now look at the next verse here, Luke chapter 1, verse 37. This is a verse that says, For nothing will be impossible with God. Now we might look at that verse and think, well, it says it right there. There's absolutely nothing that is impossible for God, but in the context in Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel has appeared to Mary and has said, You will give birth to a child, and Mary protests... And she says, how can it be that I will be pregnant? I've never been with a man. I've never slept with a man. How can I become pregnant? And it is in that context that the angel says, for nothing will be impossible with God. The angel is not saying nothing in the absolute sense, but nothing in this particular context. Even there are things that even God cannot do. One of those things is not, apparently, enabling Mary to be pregnant, which he was able to do. What we're going to talk about tonight is things, two things that not even God can do. Now, in order to understand this, we have to understand the nature of reality, the nature of the material universe and the immaterial universe. 
there are only two kinds of entities. Every single thing that exists in the universe, everything that exists in the universe, from this Bible, to this pulpit, to these flowers, to this microphone, to this shirt, to the pews that you are sitting on, to you. Every single thing that you have ever seen, everything that anyone has ever seen, everything in this room and out of this room, everything fits into one of two categories. One of how many categories? Two categories. It is either necessary, number one, or number two, contingent. Now, try and understand this. Let's start with number two, contingent. A contingent being or a contingent thing is something that exists because it was caused to exist by another source, right? So for example, why does this water bottle exist? Why does it exist? Because someone caused it. Someone made it. Was there ever a time when this water bottle did not exist? Yeah, absolutely. This water bottle likely did not exist a year ago. It certainly didn't exist a hundred years ago. And so we ask the question, is it necessary for this water bottle to exist? Is it necessary? Absolutely not. Here's another way of saying it. Is it possible for this water bottle to not exist? Is its non-existence possible? Yeah, would reality continue to function as we think of reality as functioning? Absolutely. So this water bottle is contingent on somebody making it. It has no essence. It has no existence on its own. It only has existence because somebody, something has made it. And you are exactly the same. I was born August 16th, 1972. I began uh, my life, at least outside of my mother's womb, on that day, August 16th, 1972. Is my non-existence possible? Has there ever been a time when I didn't exist? Yeah. Where was I in 1950? Where was I? It's a difficult question to answer, isn't it? I was nowhere, because there was no I, there was no me. Your non-existence is possible. It would be possible for you not to exist. But here you do exist. Well, why do you exist? Because your parents gave birth to you. Does that make sense? Now, why do your parents exist? Because their parents gave birth to them. Well, why do their parents exist? Because their parents gave birth to them. Well, why do their... And this is what is called a regress of causation. A regress of causation. It's very simple to understand. My young boy, he comes to me and he says, Papa, where did I come from? You came from Mama's belly. Oh, okay. And he goes off and he plays. And he's happy for about six months. And after a little while, he comes back and he says, Papa? And I say, yes, Landon. He says, where did Mama come from? Oh, good question. Mama came from her Mama's belly. Grandma? Oh. Okay, so he goes off and he plays. He's happy. He's a happy little boy. Six, seven years old, he's happy. So then one day he comes back, he says, Papa? I say, yes, Landon. He says, where did Grandma come from? Good question. Grandma came from great-grandma's belly. Oh, okay. So he goes off and he plays for a shorter time now. And he comes back very shortly and he says, Papa, uh, where did great-grandma come from? This is what's called a regress of causation, right? Here is Landon, here is David, here is Richard, here is George, and we have a regress, gave birth to, gave birth to, gave birth to. Does this make sense, everyone? A regress of causation all the way back. Now, this regress of causation cannot extend infinitely into the past. Let me illustrate that. Can you count to 10? Can you do it? Let's do it together. Let's see if we can do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We did pretty good. Can you count to 100? Let's do it. Just kidding. 
Can you count to 1,000? If you had enough time, could you count to 10,000? Could you count to a million if you had enough time? Sure. You could count to any finite number if you had enough time. Does that make sense? But what if I said, I want you to count to infinity? Could you do that? You cannot count to infinity because it doesn't have an end. It doesn't have an end. It's impossible to count to infinity, even if you had all of the time in the universe. Because just as you thought you came to the end, you would realize there was still an infinity beyond. You could count to 100, you could count to 1,000, you could count to 10,000, you could count to 100,000, but you could never count to infinity. Now watch this. Here's my son Landon, here's me, here's my dad, here's my granddad, here's my great granddad, here's my great great granddad, here's my great 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 granddad, here's my great 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 granddad, here's my all the way back. Now, this will go back for a while, but it cannot go back an infinitely long period of time because you cannot move through an infinite series of anything. You have to have at some point, as we're going back, and my great 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 granddad, and my great 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 granddad, and my great 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 granddad, and my great 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 great. At some point, as you are moving back, you come to a place where you you stop. You stop. And when you stop, you stop at something. Now listen very carefully. That caused something, but was not itself caused by anything. Does this make sense? You know what you call this thing? God. God is the uncaused cause of all things. Where did God come from? Who created God? When Moses was standing at the burning bush, and God said to Moses, I want you to go tell that rascal Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses said, well, who shall I say sent me? What was God's response? He said, tell them, do you remember? I am that I am. I am that I am. The verb am is the present tense of the verb to be. To be. Am is to exist. I am. God here says, I exist. The very best way to describe God is as a self-existent being. God was never begun. God was never created. God was never born. God is. I am. In the Hebrew, the word here is haya. Haya. Say that with me if you would. Haya. Sounds like karate. Haya. Haya. It's the word haya. It means to be. Many scholars believe that the name for God is Yahweh, or might be Yahweh. Listen to the similarity. Haya. Yahweh. That the very name of God, Yahweh, comes from the verb to be. God didn't have a beginning. You did. This water bottle did. This pulpit did. This building did. These flowers did. There are only two kinds of beings in the universe. Number one, beings that are necessary. That is to say, a being that has to exist. A being whose non-existence is impossible. How many necessary beings are there in the universe? How many beings have to exist? How many beings cannot not exist? One. His name is God. Every other being was made by God. We learned that this morning. God was a creator. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Let there be a moon, there was a moon. Let there be a sun, there was a sun. Let there be a planet, there was a planet. And then he came to create man. God is the one who is creating. He is not himself created. God is the first uncaused cause of all subsequent causes. God made you. God made the, by extension, he made the building, he made the flowers. 
everything if we go back. If we rewind the tape of life, here's my son, here's me, here's my dad, here's my granddad, here's my great-granddad. If we rewind the tape of life, it has to stop somewhere because there cannot be an infinite number of causes before today and it stops at the I am the I am is and always has been this is what scripture means when it says he is the alpha and the omega he is the first and the last he is the one who is who was and whoever will be are we together everyone every other being was made by God sometimes directly such as in the case of Adam and sometimes indirectly such as the case with you he made you through your parents are we together everyone so far so good okay keep this in your mind there are two kinds of beings number one necessary how many necessary beings are there one and that is and how many contingent beings are there billions everybody else is a contingent being now with this in mind open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews open your Bible to the book of Hebrews where are we going everyone we're going to Hebrews Hebrews chapter 10 two things God cannot do two things God cannot do Hebrews chapter 10 join me there if you would Hebrews chapter 10 we're going to pick it up in verse 1 Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 for the law the writings of Moses having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never what does your Bible say everyone can never let's say that word together can let's say it together can never with these same sacrifices that's the sacrifice of animals which they offer continually now I don't know if you underline in your Bible if you underline in your Bible, I'm going to encourage you to underline a few words here. I do underline in my Bible. And in my Bible, I have underlined the word never. That's an important word. Never. I underline that. Then I offer, underline the word continually and the phrase year by year. Never, continually, year by year. Make those who approach perfect. Verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sins. Verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. Do you see what he's saying? He's basically saying the sacrifice of lambs and the sacrifice of rams and the sacrifice of bullocks and the sacrifice of turtle doves are obviously not taking away sins. The Apostle Paul is building a case here. He says, obviously, they didn't take away any sins because they had to keep being offered year after year, continually. If, in fact, those sacrifices of lambs and bullocks and sheep and goats were actually taking away sins, he says, then we wouldn't remember our sins anymore. He says, but why do we keep having to offering them year after year after year, day after day after day? And Paul feels compelled by the evidence to come to a single conclusion, and that conclusion is in verse 4. Look at verse 4. This is the conclusion that he feels absolutely compelled to come to. He says, for it is not, what does your Bible say? Possible. What would be another way of saying that? It is not possible. We could say it is impossible. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sins. It is not what? It is not what? Possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sins. Jump down to verse 11. Stay in Hebrews chapter 10. Jump down to verse 11. And every priest stands ministering. Now, if you're underlining, I would underline the word daily. Daily. 
and offering, I would underline the word, repeatedly. The same sacrifices which can, here's our word again, which can, what does your Bible say? Never take away sins. So listen to these phrases. Look at verse 1. Continually, year by year. Now look at verse 11. Daily, repeatedly. Paul is just using synonyms here. He, he's, he's, he's obviously language, he's looking for words to say the same thing. And so he says the same thing in four different ways. Continually, year by year, daily, and repeatedly. In other words, what he's saying is it happens over and over and over and over, and he finds four ways to say the very same thing, and then he reminds us a second time, these sacrifices can never take away sins. They can what, everyone? Never take away sins sins. It's not possible. Apparently, when it came time for God to save you, and when it came time for God to save me, uh, maybe this is the best illustration that I can use. Do you like to eat cereal? Do any of you eat cereal in the morning? I don't know. Is that a Filipino thing? Man. Do you know what cereal is? Okay, then you'll follow this. In the States, we eat cereal like crazy. It's, it's, it's absurd. I'm like the biggest cereal eater in the world. My wife will prepare like an amazing meal, and she'll make some great peppers or some pasta or some rice or some curry, and I'll eat a great big helping, and then I'll be like, I, I just need something more. I, I, I I need a bowl of cereal. And so when I go to my cupboard, if you ever came and visited me, which you're welcome to do, if you came to my house, when I open up my cereal cupboard, it's like, oh. I have so many different kinds of cereal. I mean, I have like 10 different kinds of cereal because I never know what I'm going to feel like, you know? I got cornflakes and I got Rice Krispies and I got like four different kinds of granola. I got peanut butter puffins. I got... I, I got so many different kinds of, because I never know what I'm going to feel like. So I like to just sometimes go look at the different cereals in my cupboard. Yeah, what do I want? I'm going to go peanut butter puffins today. Yeah. And sometimes if I can't make up my mind, I'll mix them. A little bit of this, a little bit of this, and I get, I get crazy. Now watch this. When man fell, when man in the Garden of Eden fell, God knew that man was in trouble. That's why he went looking for him. Adam! Adam, where are you? Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat of? God goes looking for Adam. God knows that Adam is in trouble. And when God goes to the cupboard, to open up the cupboard, how, how can I save man? Let me see you. Uh, how many options are available to me? Let me, let, I gotta save man. Let me, let me open it up. Guess how many options there were? It was nothing like my cereal cupboard. There was exactly one option. In an amazing vision that Ellen White gives in the book Early Writings, she tells the story of the fall of man. And she says that when Satan tempted, successfully tempted Adam and Eve to sin, that all of heaven was filled with sorrow. They'd already seen war in heaven. They'd already seen Satan cast out in a third of the angels. And then they saw Satan gain a victory on earth, and the angels were like, ah, this is terrible. A man who was made in the image of God is going to be lost, and he's going to join in the rebellion. And then a council took place. A council between the members of the Godhead, the Spirit, and Christ, and the Father. And they came together. Ellen White saw this in vision. It's a very interesting thing she saw. She saw Jesus go into the presence of the Father. She says he was absorbed. He was, he was, he was enclosed in light. She asked her attending angel, what's going on? Is, what is this? It's, it's a council. The Bible calls this the Council of Peace. 
And when Jesus came out of the Council of Peace, he addressed the angels. Now, I want you to pretend right now for a moment that you're the angels. Just pretend. You're the angels. Pretend like I'm Jesus making the announcement. Jesus steps out and he says, My beloved angelic host, I've got some great news. I have been meeting with the Father, and we have made a way to save mankind. How do you feel? How do you feel? Woo! You know, you can just imagine. You can just see the angels in your mind's eye. They're like, yeah, we knew we'd figure it out. High five, high five. Boom. Yeah, we got them. Woo! You know, you just, you, you can feel it. it. It feels good. And the angels are like, yeah. Yeah, we got the best of him. He's not going to, you know, there's this sense. But then she says that Jesus told them how. Hey, hey, hey I, I understand your excitement. I understand your excitement. Let me tell you how we're going to do this. I will become a man. And the angel said, what? Yes, I will become a man. I will go down and I will be born in a manger. I'll be a little baby and I will be poor and I will be rejected. What? The angels couldn't believe what they were hearing. Yes, and not only will I be rejected, I will be hated, I will be betrayed. I will be spat upon, and I will be killed. Ellen White says, direct quote, she says, the angels could not rejoice. They were happy that man would be saved. When they heard that, they thought, oh, yes, yes, yes. But when they heard how, she says they could not rejoice. Now, what she saw next in vision is astonishing. The woman was amazing, by the way. Absolutely, totally amazing. What she saw in vision was this. The angels came to Jesus, and they said, Jesus, sir, with all due respect, we will go. We cannot even imagine you enduring rejection, pain, ignominy, humiliation, and death. We will go. We will go. Now watch this. Right there on the screen. Right on the screen. Here we go. The angels prostrated themselves before him. What does that next sentence say? I want you to read it nice and loud for me. They, they offered their lives. Jesus, I can just imagine Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus said to them that he would by his death save many and, now watch this, that the life of an angel could not pay the debt. Now, I want to ask you a simple question. How many kinds of beings are there in the universe? Two kinds of beings. Who remembers? Two kinds. Two. Okay? What are they? What's the first one? Necessary. And what's the other one? Contingent. Question. Which are angels? Are they necessary beings or are they contingent beings? Are they created or uncreated? They're contingent and they are created. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 again. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 again. Verse 4. It says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. I want to ask you a question. What do bulls and goats and angels have in common? 